so differently than most industries that we get to leave a legacy of knowledge, of experience, and then pay that forward and watch. That's how I got into management. People say all the time, why'd you get into management? Because I love watching somebody I've taught something to take it and run and then run past it. Welcome, everybody. I'm so amped up to have a, a personal friend of mine appear in our recent CEO series uh, for Vision, Hustle, Grit, and Gratitude. Today, I have the one and only Scott Greenfield. Scott's the president and CEO of Capstone Financial LLC. Capstone Financial LLC is one of the most explosive brands in the financial services arena over the last five years. They're based out of Georgia, Atlanta area, Buckhead to be specific, but Scotty and his team have built a multi-state operation in less than five years. They've had incredibly explosive growth and really timely to have someone like Scott here to speak about leadership lessons, a uh, growing and scaling an incredible team and sales organization. I can't wait to also hit on some personal things with his family and go long for Luke. Scott, thanks for being here with us today. Oh, thank you, Manny, for inviting me. I was looking forward to this for a long time. Well, as, 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 as our guests know, the first three questions are always very quick. Hey, what's your favorite color? Blue. Favorite afternoon snack? Ooh, Snickers bar. Favorite childhood superhero? Ooh, I'm a Justice League fan. Didn't like one. I like the whole table. So, because you never knew what you were going to get, but I'm a Justice League fan. I love it. I love it. So look, let, let's go. I, I want to touch really quick on the professional side of things, and we're going to zigzag all over the place. I think the big buckets for today... I want to talk a lot about what you've built in the last five years or so in the Southeast. I mean, coming from the New York area to go down to Georgia. I mean, I think it's an incredible story. Number two, I want to talk about leadership lessons. And number three, the third biggest bucket before we end with personal, I want to hear about how you've, you've, you've just kind of built this like magic sauce for growing and scaling a sales organization. I think a lot of young up and coming sales professionals and C-suite executives like ourselves could take a lot from that. But let's start with you, you go from New York city, hustling the big apple and then Chicago, you were like my biggest nightmare in my own hometown for a number of years as a friendly competitor, take us through your career path and wrap that up at the end with what gave you and Sandy the right amount of energy, excitement, and enthusiasm to move this incredible career you had down to the Southeast? Coming to the Southeast, Manny, was an opportunity that, again, one of the first lessons I can to teach anybody is find great mentors. Find people that you can entrust now and that you can learn from and just grab from and they're willing to give and you're, and you're smart enough to take. So I think one of the greatest lessons I learned from one of my mentors was when I got this opportunity to leave New York and Chicago and things that we built over almost a decade in, 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 in my old firm was my mentor saying to me, coming to me and said, hey, here's the opportunity. And he goes, you can do this. You can do this and go kill it. And just saying that in my office in a real quick two seconds, hey, this is the opportunity great for you and Sandy. You're going to kill it. Well, I'll, uh, he goes, you and I will get together later on and really go into the details. And he walked out of my office. I called my wife and she's like excited, nervous, but just that confidence from a mentor who basically put me under his wing and said, Hey, you can do this on your own. You can be number one was a huge, you know, you know, boost of my confidence right from the day I, the day I got that opportunity. I want to stay right here because I know your mentor and, and I just, I think the world of him and his family, the little bit, I know his family, but how well I know him. And, and I've just always just been inspired uh, when uh, he's in the same room and communicating, you know, with just tremendous vision and commitment for what we do. What were a couple things 
you've had an incredibly long relationship with him. What mm-hmm. are a couple things for our listeners uh, that your mentor did consistently that really moved the needle for you, your confidence and your development? It's a great question. I would say I, I look at my pool of mentors from the first day on Wall Street to the day I got the opportunity to come here and still to this day. I've had some pretty good mentors in my career and they all had the same, same sort of message. The message was you have the opportunity if you grind at it, put your head down and just go to work. And that was universal for my first mentor, Tony on Wall Street, teaching me how to prospect, how to know, you know learning about investing money to my last mentors. It's been the same message. Work hard, be a student of your craft, learn from people, give back, and you will be successful. And that's always been a message. And to me, that is always something that I'm looking to strive for. Who is going to be a next mentor in my library of mentors? I still lean on my old mentors from my old firm quite often. And I will always lean on them because as as long as they're willing to give, I'm willing to take. Uh, But I'm always looking for somebody to get that next bit of knowledge and opportunity to learn and, and, and become a student of the craft. And that's how I think being successful has allowed me to be successful because I'm definitely not the smartest person in the room when I'm in a room. You know, you, 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 you referenced uh, work ethic, which I, I, you know, I just don't, I don't know of anyone ever speaking of a great mentor in front of me that didn't acknowledge the fact that it took a lot of work. Right. And, and I think uh, my experience has been that the greatest mentors are one that really pour into us with not just what they know, but with just their time, you know, both professionally and personally. Let's talk a little bit about the, the soft skills or the, the areas where your best mentors have had a high EQ and the little things they've done and that you now do for the team you have, this incredible team you have down there in Georgia and really a multi-state team now, which congratulations on that and that explosion over the last four years. But what are some ways that you now pour into the people on your team uh, uh, to tell them that you care and to help them get better? Proving that it's a relationship, it's a partnership. And I think that's Every mentor I had, and I think the relationships that I have today from past firms that I still have today and going forward, and the the relationships I've built down here since I've been here, it's been around relationships and building the trust that we're here together to to build it together and truly caring about people's needs and wants outside of the office is I think that's where I think why I'm still close to my mentors because there's relationships like you and I, our relationship has expanded way beyond just you and I's relationship over a decade. I look at you as a mentor in some aspects, hopefully you look at me as a mentor in some aspects, is our our, our wives have a relationship, allowing the family to grow in a way that, you know, business is business, relationship is relationship, but we're all here driving towards the same passion of being impactful to people we meet and impactful to our own fans. So, uh, you know, that is one of the things that I've always admired, you know, when, when I'm in your presence or we're together at conferences, whether it's in with the industry or internally, you know, the relationship, the relationship equity that I think the outsiders perceive of what you've been able to create with your folks is just in a league of its own. Are there are there a couple things that you and Sandy are really passionate about or a, a few things that the firm really obsesses about doing, which is what makes it such a great place, a great culture, uh, an, an incredible organization to work for? Well, that's, I think, the, the biggest thing about COVID is, we, is what we learned is the value of the relationships. Just getting together, yes. having the ability of, after a hard day work, after a long week, having the ability of just going out and just socializing. 
uh, having our firm get togethers that we have spending, bringing the families together. I think that really is been one of the biggest, I guess, ahas about COVID is how important that is to an sure. organization and how that important is to my personal culture. And I think that's how we build a firm is around those relationships. It, 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 one of the things I, I want to, because I want to just stay on, on, on what you've been building in recent years yeah. uh, for one more question. I think this is yeah. really important. Um, I, from the outside looking in, my impression has been is you not only retained some of the most incredible talent that was already within the organization, but a lot of this explosive growth can also be attributed to some of the key hires you've made since you arrived in the Atlanta area and specifically Buckhead. Talk to me just about your hiring philosophy. You know, I, I, my impression is you hire teammates, not people to be the boss too, which I think is important to differentiate. There's the difference between being the boss and being the team captain. And in my impression is you're a team captain, you hire great teammates, share some of your hiring philosophies, do's or don'ts, or maybe lessons. Absolutely. I think one of the things I always try to, I guess, position myself and the firm is I'm a partner, not a boss. I will have to say no from time to time. It's not because I want to, it's because we have to, it's because it's the right business decision, but this is the reason why. So I'll be a part and help you grow your business. And I think my lesson of recruiting is really a simple, it's, it's, it's as simple as three questions, simple three questions. And this is something I think you use in any sort of business from in any hiring or any position you're looking for really comes down to would, and here they are, would you buy from that person? Would you allow that person to be an advisor in your life and guide you and your family's life financially? Second question I always ask of myself and also of my staff, you know, my sales managers and my recruiters. Number two is simply, would you do, would you do business with them as joint work partners and say, this is my partner I'm doing business with. That's reputation. Are you willing to do that with this person? And the third uh, question we always ask is, can you socialize with somebody? And I always make a joke. Can we sit at the same table and not throw a roll at each other at one of our banquets or one of our awards events? Can you socialize and have, you know, and have some, some camaraderie and some collaboration? And if those three questions are answered, those are the people we want to be part of our family. Now, where they are in their business could be, you know, two days, could be 25 years, 30 years, 40 years. But if those three questions are answered, we want them part of the family and they're going to be coming to us for the right reason. Help grow your business. I'm going to partner with you. I want to help expand time. I'm going to help you expand your business. All the things that we should do in our seats and why people should come to us. Don't hit the... Don't hit the, you know, the ceiling. I want to break ceilings. I want you to come here to break a ceiling and get to a level that you can't even see yet. And that's something that was taught to me by one of my mentors was like, you don't see how good you are. You don't see how good you can be. And you don't see your success. Just believe in what I'm telling you and what we're telling you, you will yeah. get there. And you don't believe it until you get there. You turn around and go, huh, never thought I can get there, right? Never thought I can get there. So those are the types of things that I want to sort of picture when I'm recruiting somebody or talking to somebody about joining the family is, do you see a ceiling? Do you see past that ceiling? And do you, can you get past that ceiling where you are today? And do you need, can we partner together to get you to where you don't even see yet? And that's sort of my overall philosophy. Questions are important. That's culture. I don't want anybody in our organization that won't fit the culture the collaborative culture and from, from the perspective of why us, I'm going to make sure you're telling me you want to break that ceiling when they're breaking. So I, I, I love the fact that you just read reference, break the ceiling. You know, I wanted to pivot a little bit into uh, some of your leadership philosophies, you know, around servant leadership, growing and building an incredible team and it takes me right to one of the questions I had, which I've always wanted to ask you this and I never have. So I want, I want to be clear right now. I've never asked Scotty G this question. And yet I've always been curious because of my time in Chicago and my familiarity with these two people. 
my perspective on breaking through ceilings is helping our people stand on our shoulders. And that's, that's a, an analogy that I make often, which is this is how we're going to help you through break through the ceiling, standing on our shoulders. We stand on the shoulders of others to get to the next level. How the heck did you go out and get one of the best COOs in Adam Bass and one of the very best minds in advisor productivity and selling in Teresa Fitzgerald? How the heck did that happen? I'm a good salesperson. No, uh, uh, all kidding aside, relationships. That is the the epitome of relationships. I was very, very lucky to partner with Adam when he was at my old firm overseeing Chicago. We became very close personally and also very successful professionally. And when the opportunity came down in here, I was always told, you are as good as your people. You're as good as your people. Our job is easy if I have great people. I get to play golf every day, right? But you got to have great people. So when the opportunity came up for Adam to basically say, hey, I think I want to get back. I want to bring the band back together and let's do the success again. It was a pretty easy conversation and perfect time. And that was relationship. And leapfrog that one forward. Teresa and Adam were partners working together at their old firm opportunity came up they always were they always remained friends conversation happened vision happened and then i think anybody will come to you if you have the right vision and mission right and they believed in the mission of the firm and the vision of where where we're uh, where we're going to take it and again i'm a good salesman wink wink but all, uh and they saw the future and they said come on they were willing to make they were willing to move their families and believe in the future. And those are great partners for me. So it makes my job a little easier when you have great talent. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, that's really special, uh, you know, because um, I, I just through social media, you know, I know of your recruiter, I think it's Caroline, uh, you know, who seems incredibly sharp and talented. I, and I know of Whit Sanning, uh, mm-hmm. but I, you know, I mentioned Adam and Teresa because, you know, we grew up in the same neighborhood while we grew up in the business. And while I didn't know them well, I've always known of them and had a tremendous amount of respect for the things that they were accomplishing and achieving in our extremely noble profession uh, in the Chicago market. So congratulations again to you and your entire team that I don't know, uh, because I, I know that it's a really special story and it's a great organization. Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's, it's really a mix of what was here before. We, I, I got lucky. There was some unbelievably advised, some incredible advisors, some incredible people that were part of the firm. Uh, I was able to partner with them. And, you know, one piece of advice that I can never give anybody, somebody coming in and taking over a whole firm, coming from a different state, coming from a different background and taking over a different firm. Uh, a business coach once told me, listen, don't talk. Get to know somebody. Don't make a decision for 90 days. Did I break that decision? Of course, within the first 15 minutes, I was at the firm, but it was in the right area. Uh, it was in the right area, but really get to know people, get to know what, you know, what, you know, what keeps them up at night, both in their business and in their families. And then you'll learn to figure out a way to build a culture. And that was one of the best advices that I ever got from a business coach. Uh, and it allowed me to sort of build those relationships in the beginning. But then now... With that, and I brought in some talent. I have my head of advanced planning and somebody we worked with for many, many years, moved up from Florida to Atlanta to work here. It's probably the most humbling thing from uh, my seat is actually people have moved their families, their kids to come to Atlanta, come to Buckhead and to partner with me and partner with the vision and believe that this is the place they want to be for the future. Yeah, I mean, it, it. I would imagine it takes a lot for someone to be able to make that type of uh, professional pivot, especially when a relocation is required. You know, the pandemic has taught us that people are willing to relocate a lot more today than they were probably 24, 36 months ago. You know, when we're focused here on this topic of leadership and servant leadership, what are one or two things that Capstone Financial has learned 
about working through the pandemic, keeping its people safe, keeping its people happy and keeping its people productive because the sales numbers have been sensational. So talk to me about a few of the things that have uh, decisions that have been well-made and executed at Capstone Financial. Well, I think decision one, when March 13th happened, uh, you know, we were just, that was the last time I saw you, Manny, we were together a yep. couple of days before everything sort of shut down. Uh, I decided to do a couple of things, shut down the office, really take the leadership from, from mass, from the home office perspective. I was the only one that came into the office and every day just to make sure the office was still running. Mail was, uh, was still being done and really just learned about family first, employee first, safety first, and everything that we needed to do. And I learned very early on through study groups, conversations with people like you and friends. We don't know if we're doing everything right, but let's over communicate. If we over communicate and we stay in front of everything and we talk to our, and we talk to our employees and our advisors and we keep everybody abreast of what's going on. As long as we're together communi and communicating and have a plan it should work out. And that's when we've taken it very slow and steady to, to, to reopen. And we're still not open yet with clients. We're still at skeleton staff. Still people still work half at home. Sure. So, and even though down here, we're a little bit more opened up in some parts of the country, but we're still taking a very slow and steady approach to this. And what have I learned? Anything can happen. Be ready for anything to happen. Be ready to, make phone yeah. calls to people and, and have a plan of communication, really have a, a hardcore plan. How can you, can you get information out to all your people inside of your family, both through normal communication, the old school way, the phone, sure, and through new technology that you have at your fingertips. What, what is something that, I mean, let's talk about maybe where the puck is going in leadership before we pivot to uh, uh, serving and growing and scaling a sales organization, uh, because I want to dig into that a little bit. But let's talk about a little bit about where the puck is going in leadership. What's, what's something you've been thinking about, you and your team have been discussing that, that you believe has some merit in applying or implementing in the way you serve, grow, and develop your people that could be helpful for our listeners to, to be mindful of or start researching now? It's collaboration, it's teamwork, and it's access to information. Is tell, tell me about that, because I, I know a lot about you on that topic. Share a little bit about the, the power of data and, and access to information and how much that's been a part of your success. And, and, and it's imperative. It's yeah. imperative. That's, that's uh, another one of my mentors taught me about the, the importance of data. Data wins. The, the more data you have, the more knowledge you have, the, you, the more ability you can be impactful to people in the right way and efficiently. And with data comes process. Mm. With the proper data, you can create the proper process. And having the proper process, again, allows us to be efficient, impactful, and especially in this day and age when we, when we can't get in front of somebody like we used to, we can't sit across that dining room table, that table at Starbucks, that conference room, where we can't be yes. that impactful. It allows us to have the data, allows us and have the process, it allows us to be laser focused and allows us to be impactful while we have the time in front of, in front of, in front of the camera with our clients now. Uh, let me ask you one last question on that. Just a, a follow up. Uh, yeah. How often do you find yourself sitting at the table, at the boardroom table, with the uh, data analytical folks on your team, considering what's working, what's not working, any uh, adjustments or pivots that should be made to achieve better results? What's what's the what's the the recurrency of how often is that happening? Daily, weekly, monthly. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, need to, I need to I, resign. Yeah, yeah. I look at it this way. I, I look at it leading indicators, lagging indicators, right? Yes. Okay. So I'm sort of looking at it in both ways. 
So leading indicators, I probably won't look at daily. I'm looking more weekly, monthly, quarterly, and that's more round activity. Because the, the leading indicator sure. in our business of bad activity, I can pretty much, I've been doing this a long time, I'm old, see the gray hair, right? I'm pretty much doing this a long time. You give me X amount of activity. I have an equation in my head. It will give me X amount of, of revenue out this end, right? So that's where I'm focusing on my data with my manager sort of development in the pure development aspect. I'm teaching my managers to teach the proper habits to create the proper indicators. And the indicators for us is activity. The proper mm -hmm. appointments, the proper branding, the proper of you getting out there and trying to be impactful to somebody. So that's where I sort of look at it that way. And lagging indicators is, okay, how am I looking for the business perspective, for growth perspective and development perspective? How do we break those ceilings? You know, how do, what does a, a good first quarter mean to the fourth quarter? What is my my leading indicators of activity help my lagging indicators of growing my business and sure. where do they intersect? So I sort of look at it in multiple different ways, but my, my I'm, a, you know, I can't spell three words together, but numbers in my head, I'm constantly looking at numbers and I'm always looking for myself. I'm always looking at daily activity and I'm looking today's daily activity. And then I'm going back 60 days looking at my lagging indicators is my equation of my dollars coming out of revenue happening from 60 days ago. Because if my process is working, we should be getting revenue in a six to an eight, in an eight week period from initial activity. Okay. So let's talk about scaling a sales organization. Sure. Um, it, it, that, that pivots well into it, it, especially with, I know your obsession about looking at the daily activity. You know, wh what are, what are the, you know, a few, but at least three, what are a few, but at least three very specific characteristics or skill sets you're looking in the type of people that you are hiring on a daily, weekly, monthly basis at Capstone Financial? Same always, fire and desire. Number one, they got to have fire and desire to not only be successful for themselves, but truly have a purpose of being impactful to who they interact with. It's a, it's a joint success in our business. Not only financially, you do it really well, you can be financially successful, but you're missing the other piece of the puzzle. It means you're not being impactful. That's the way I look at the passion of, you know, of what I have. So the fire and desire to be that, okay? The, the work ethic and really in our business, and I am was... I banged my head against my cement bowl numerous times in my career, in my 27 years, coachable. Having yeah. the ability of taking a mentor like us, our sales managers from, and allowing us to be impactful to you and you, are you coachable enough to learn? And that goes from experienced producers to the brand new advisors coming into the industry. So those are the three things that I'm looking for. Fire and desire is number one. Are you hungry? Yeah. Are you willing to go after it? Yeah, it's difficult to, uh, I've, I've also found it's very difficult to teach appetite, right? It's very difficult to each appetite either, <laughs> to teach appetite. Either right. you want a lot or you don't. I can teach habits, you know, 21 days, getting into, you know, teaching some of the proper habits, but fire and desire, having a purpose and meaning of what, why do you get out of bed every day? Like, Anybody can say, why do you get out of bed every day, right? We all have a purpose, right? You should have a purpose. And that purpose to drive you to be successful so you, you can achieve that. And that is, I'm looking for somebody that has, it's not monetary. It's, it could be absolutely around community, around your family. It's something having the ability, sure. like, I like to say simply, I can. We want all of our advisors, my mind. I know if I succeeded, when I retire, I walk out that day. If I could turn around, I could look at all my advisors and in, in my organization that I've impacted in my career. And, they, and I've said to them, they could all say to me, Scott, you know what? We can. I've succeeded. And what I mean by we can, Manny, is I can go on vacation. 
I can put my kid through school. Yeah. I can retire. I can buy a second house. I can donate all my money to, to my charitable cause. I can. I might not want to, but I can. Having the power to say I can financially is a powerful thing. You don't have to buy seven, eight cars, eight, 12 homes, whatever that is. Having the way I can is a very powerful thing. So if I can turn around and say, I, I help build businesses for my advisors that they can turn around and say to their families, we can, I've succeeded. Yeah, what was that, like 2001 when Cypress Hill dropped Rock Superstar? And I was like, oh my gosh, this is one of the sickest tracks of all time. And it, it, you know, in my head, as as I've hopefully matured a tiny bit over the last 20 years, I've thought, you know, it's not about the fact that you want, you know, a big house or five cars. And that is quote, Cypress Hill, big house, five yep. cars. Sure. But it's it's about whatever that vision is that you have for your life. This is one of the most noble professions that by doing really great work for others, almost servant leadership type work in adding value to others, financial reality and their quality of life, the financial security, stability and success. We are so well rewarded to then equally have that power of choice around all matters financial. And just what, what an incredible and, and noble profession to choose, right? It, I think so. Yeah. And one, of the, and one of the things that I think people in our business don't understand one of the really things you can do is I think we're the one, we're one of the greatest pay it forward industries in the world. Yes. Share more. Okay. What I mean, pay it forward. We can, we as leaders, okay. Successful professionals, we get to teach, we get to bring people behind us forward and a little knowledge. And we're able to give our experience back to the next generation so differently than most industries that we get to leave a legacy of knowledge of experience and then pay that forward and watch. That's how I got into management. People say all the time, you know, I was a pretty successful producer. I wasn't the best, but I had a decent business. Why'd you get into management? Because I loved watching somebody I taught something to take it and run and then run past me. <laughs> and that was always cool. So I think for, you know, somebody that, you know, you know, one of the things I will say about leadership, don't get into leadership for the money. Get into leadership because you truly want to make a difference in multiple people's lives that will make, make an impact in multiple people's other lives. If you're really good at doing that, you will be successful financially, but don't get in for the money. Yeah. We have a whole it, podcast on why not to get in for the money for management in the beginning. Well, well so, but but you're you you consistently are bringing up themes around work ethic and coachability, right? So let's talk about coachability because that was your third point of what you're looking for in folks. Share share with the, our listeners what are two or three of the skill sets that your firm over invests and pours into its people. To ensure they develop those, time. Share more. Time. time. Just willing to spend time in teaching, in showing, in role playing. What I think one of the things in our industry that is is lacking is to have people like me sit down with a brand new advisor and have that conversation. Allow them to see us do it and role play and come to us with experiences and opportunities that they have for us to share our experience to allow them to grow faster. It's one of the, it's one of the lessons that I think is imperative in development and time is spending that time. The, the seconds and minutes and hours you spend, if you can quantitate that in dollars and cents, you really can't put how much over time as a leader, as a manager, as a leader of an organization, what that will do. If you can impact somebody early on, 24, 25, 26, how long, what, what is that time investment then to the revenue you bring over the long time and the runway that they have? That 100% resonates and is ex exactly, I think, the way most of us who know you well 
perceive the type of organization that you continue to grow and build and scale uh, uh, to serve its clients. W- what's a specific skill set that you would say if there's a bunch of sales professionals not in our industry, not with Capstone Financial, but disturbed, disturbed by the reality of today, uh, disturbed by the the uh, development investment their current firm is pouring into them. What's a specific skill set that you'd say with Teresa and Adam and all the other folks in sales leadership within your firm that you're developing within your people to help them be successful on their own? Uh, We just had this conversation this morning, uh, helping them, but then throwing them in in the deep end when they're ready and making them uncomfortable. Because somebody's always afraid to say, can I see you do it one more time? Yes. I see you do it one more time. And I will. And then sometimes I'll just say, I won't show up to a meeting because I know you're ready. And I want you to do it because I know you're ready. So teach. Teach them how to fish. Teach them where to fish, how to fish, and how to be great at it. And then just allow them to be great. And one of the things I try to do from a leadership perspective, and I learned this again from another mentor, put people in positions of strength, take things away from them that they're really not good at. They're not passionate about and watch that person succeed. So what I try to do is put my managers in the right lanes of where they're best going to perform and work as a collaborative team. So strengths, Enhanced strengths, weaknesses are diminished because you're you're if you build the right team together, it will be very cohesive. Strengths will have weaknesses, weaknesses will have strengths, and they'll work together in a cohesive team. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. So um, you know, because of time, I, I want to pivot to the personal side for a few minutes, sure. if you're okay with that. Absolutely. I'm an open so, book. The first lady of capstone. Financial LLC, Sandy. The boss, yes. I mean, you know how we feel about her. She's incredible. There's no doubt that she's sprinkling fairy dust all over everything you're doing. Give give me an example. Give us an example of, of how she's been a part of this just unbelievable trajectory. I mean, I look, I knew of you. I think you were at MetLife. Then you became like my worst friendliest nightmare in my own building in Chicago, even though you were out in New York. And I'm like, why is he in my lobby again <laughs> at one North Franklin? Yep. <laughs> why is small, he baby. in the lobby again? And then, and then we be, we become really close through various leadership development opportunities uh, and the organizations we're with. And, and so I've seen this happening from afar for probably 15 years. Talk to me about Sandy's impact on, on not just your trajectory, but talk to me about her impact on the firm and the people more than anything. Yeah. I mean, I don't think we have enough time to, to, I know we don't to, to get to the impact. You know, she's the best partner, uh, best mentor in advice. You know, she's just, she's, I call the boss, but you know, we're both bosses, right? Uh, we are a great partnership and she's always been a partner since day one. She was very successful in, in, in her own world as a recruiter back in the day uh, and gave up her career due to the situation, you know, of course, with my son and autism, but it really been a partner and really allowed me two things, allowed me to focus on my business because she runs the house. She, she allows me to focus my time here. And then since we've been here, she's in. She's been a major impact on recruiting for me. She's the best recruiter I got. She's the best salesperson I know. I, I bring her on every closing meeting. I mean, part of my shtick is, is meeting people is we have to get together with the spouses. Because I'm going to bring. I'm going to bring my. Uh, I'm going to bring. I'm going to bring the closer. I'll sit there and have appetizers. Like she's going to do all the closings. She'll say to. She'll say to you, "Why aren't you coming? You're a fool not to." You know. Uh, you know, she never she never takes no for an answer in anything that she does. And she's been a great partner for me growing the business and moving down here, giving up our lives in New York with what we had, our personalized, what the infrastructure we had with my son. Uh, it wasn't like 
shall we? What do you think? It was like, let's do it. The day I called her, she's like, let's go. She goes, we'll kill it. And she's been a great partner since. Now, how she's been incorporated in the firm, one of the great lessons I learned is we are a dysfunctional family. Our, my old firm was a big, dysfunctional, great family. We loved each other. We hated each other. We did it all. That made us great. That was really some of the greatest things about our old firm. That was one of the biggest things we had. And I put her in charge of that. You're in charge of the culture when he's getting people together. So every event, every event she plans to our trips, to she just planned our leaders event that we're doing uh, right before leaders for all leaders. She, everything around the firm. She even picked a new coffee machine today. I mean, she goes, you have, you have to have this, you have all, all these choices. So she wants the culture of the firm. And that's what she's put her stamp on. Uh, really saying, hey, this is what we are. This is what we do. And when we're going to get together, we're going to celebrate and we're going to appreciate the people that are here. And she really, re so she's the chief culture officer, I guess you could call her. She's, she really makes sure when we're together, when we need to celebrate something, when we need to, you know, say thank you, she's the one who's leading that charge. Yeah, I, you know, I really appreciate you saying that because Samantha and I obviously, you know, we have an enormous amount of affection for Sandy and your family. And uh, I, 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 I'm like, you know, I'm never surprised why her and Samantha uh, just jive and just, you know, get along and energize each other so well. And I wrote down uh, chief happiness officer uh, because it, it's like that work hard play hard mentality, but really around wanting the families of Capstone Financial to be happy, to enjoy being with each other and to look forward to that next day at the firm. And, and she's an incredible embodiment of that. And when, when you reference the few times you've mentioned her previous uh, uh, professional career outside of the home, officially in recruiting, like no one's ever surprised that she's the head of attraction in talent acquisition. Oh, yeah. There's no surprise. She's incredible and in, in, in what a blessing she is. Uh, I know to you guys, but just as a friend to us, I want to make sure though, be, that we invest at least a few minutes on, on, on Sophie and Luke's story. Sure. And in, in just an incredible story. I'm going to let you tell it, but every time I hear it, I just wish more people would take a minute to listen and, and find just a minute and a dollar to get involved. Dollars are always good. We'll take every dollar. Uh, really, that's, you know, again, to go back to what I said, having a reason to get out of bed. What it drives you, what, what's your passion? Uh, everybody has different passions. Mine is, you know, many people who know me were, were pretty open about it. Uh, I have, you know, 16-year-old twins, a phenomenal daughter who is the best of my best and my son who's uh you know who's autistic so we have you know committed our time our energy and effort and really my daughter and a couple of friends a couple of years ago about almost actually it's almost a decade really Cole started and jesse right cole yeah, and cole jesse Fowler, who, who, who are now both going to college that's how old <laughs> we're getting right uh they started the charity around raising money and awareness uh, for kids with autism around flag football. It was really around kids. And, you know, that's what drives me is our philanthropic uh, endeavors. Go Long for Luke is, is the charity. Really found, I said, by my daughter and, Jess, uh, and Jesse Cole Fowler, who are great, great kids. And we're just, that's really what our passion is long-term to build group homes, to really change the world. We always say when it comes to autism, people say to me, Oh, I'm sorry. I never said, don't never say sorry. We were chosen. We were chosen to make a difference. And that's the way we look at it. And it's an honor and a privilege. And it's a wonderful community and fighting the fights that we got to fight, especially going forward in healthcare and housing and everything that we got to do. People like, you know, as I, you know, I feel very bad for the people in the, in, who are outside the community because they got to deal with, you know, my wife. And have you say, you know, have you try to say no, but that's really what, you know, what drives me, what's, what's our passion is to, of course, take care of my son for the rest of his life. I never want my daughter to ever make a decision that she has to choose between her own failing or her brother to making sure that we have done well enough to build, you know, economics foundations, the ability to, to change the world when people look at the world of autism and some of the things that, 
the community can do. Like one of the things that I do, I only buy products and, you know, swag from a company by the name of Spectrum Designs out of New York, I only employ, you know, you know, you know, uh, autistic adults. These are things that we can help in the business community. That's a passion of ours as well. That's, uh, that's super powerful. I'm glad that you mentioned that. I wasn't aware. And you know that, you know, uh, nobody loves swag as much. Nobody as loves do. swag more than Manny does. Absolutely. <laughs> now I'll give you the name. They, they, they do wonderful, wonderful things. That's what, that's a goal of ours as well with the charity do some sort of business along attached to the charity while we're building group homes is to, again, the community gives them, there's so much the community can do that they're just given a chance. And there's people like us who hopefully, you know, if I keep doing what I'm, what I bet, you know, been doing and keep working hard and, you know, I'll have the ability to create things between economics, my community, my voice, where I'll be able to bring more people together to make a huge difference in the community. So other than the fact that you reference Go Long for Luke, is there a site or a Facebook page? Go Long that- for Luke.org. There's a big button that says donate. Go right it. We actually just gave, we made a donation today to the JCC in Atlanta uh, to help build a gym inside the, uh, some, so a sensory gym inside the JCC. So that's what we're doing right now. Because, because of COVID, we've done, we've, we've partnered with other charities to, to figure out ways to help places help reopen and do things for the community. Well, I, I will tell you, um, I, you know, man, Hey, look, um, as, as someone who has had the privilege to get to know you, I'm, I'm incredible, uh, incredibly grateful for your time today, for your willingness to always pay it forward. And in the spirit of what I know that uh, Sophie, Luke, Sandy and you embody, we also want to pay it forward. So on behalf of Ava, Atlas, Samantha and I in Mass Mutual will be making a $2,500 contribution uh, in honor of Luke and Sophie's incredible work to go long for Luke. And look, you know, unique times call for unique gestures and commitments and efforts from folks. And I just cannot think of a more meaningful organization, a more meaningful family to really stand up and support. And so Scotty G that's being sent with a ton of love from our family. And and we're just so thankful that you were willing to get on here for almost an hour and, and uh, jibber jab with me and just drop some nuggets. Uh, Listen, uh, thank you for, you know, allow me to be here, inviting me. It was great. You know, I would say if our wives don't get together soon, they're going to lose it. You know, they have to get there. You know, we've been texting for over a year since the last time we saw you guys. So hopefully that'll be happening real, real soon. But, you know, for me to you, you know, you're, you're a friend, somebody that we share ideas all the time. And this is part of what our family's about to everybody else who could be listening to this. One thing I would always say, one thing, uh, one of my mentors, Rick always says to me, and he repeats it all the time is you can't outwork me. And that's something you say to yourself, you can't outwork me. And if you, if you outwork me, the only reason I'm sitting in the seat, I'm sitting in. The only reason I have the opportunity that I have, the only reason I have any sort of success is because I was refused to outwork. And one of the things I'll, I'll leave you on this on coaching, one of the hardest things I ever had to do was learn how to be coached. Most people who talk to me in my 20s and my 30s, they would say, who's on that podcast? Greenfield is the hardest hand in the world. It, it, it took me a long, 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 long time to learn how to be coachable. And once I did, once I stopped fighting the machine and learned how to be coachable, I went from this to this. Yeah, awesome. Great parting thought. Scotty G, appreciate you, brother. Thank Have you, a man. wonderful week, best. man. You too, bud. All right. Much love to the fam. Thanks. You too, man.